at this point, if you would like, you can put your uh, view on speaker view, or you can just continue to look at this really inclusive graphic. There is much to be said about inclusivity. Generosity, welcoming, suspending of judgment, being in relationship with a person, including all of their verities. Inclusivity is broad in scope and in orientation. And when we consider the education, it strives to include students with a varied ability and the goal to be include them with the general student population. And then let's explore the word exclusive as its dualistic opposite. On one hand, it has been used to support a caste system, if you will, one that intends to prioritize some above others. Uh, perhaps you've heard the advertising exclusively just for you, or you can join this exclusive club. And these terms are intended to say, who's good enough to be a part of this club and enjoy this privilege? It's a setup to imply superiority, playing with the public's ego of wanting to be in the in crowd, to be special, valued, and wanted. In this manner, exclusion is harmful. Yet, there are times when exclusion is important. Truth is, not all people and things are going to be compatible, but exclusion does not have to be harmful. In our association and congregations, we strive to set a welcome table and we do our best to make it adaptable for all who are dining. There's room for the wheelchair to roll on up. There's a cushion and a backrest and a footrest for people whose bodies need that extra support. We can have place settings that serve the diner's physical needs. And while we're at it, let's provide sippy cups and little spoons and forks for the little ones who are learning to use them. We can accommodate the left and the right-handed people and serve foods that meet dietary and ethical needs for those in attendance. And my favorite, everybody gets to have a nice cloth napkin. You see, it takes a lot of effort to accommodate a variety of people. It takes consideration, patience, shared resources, and the willingness to do something different than the way that we have always done things. And sometimes we don't know what that person needs, so we just have to come out and ask them, what can I do to support you? so that you can comfortably be a part of this circle. Then genuinely listen to their answer and do the best we can to share and accommodate with a glad heart. According to the UUA website, nearly 50 million people, that is one in five US citizens have a disability whether it's visible or invisible, public or private. Now let's consider the term political correctness. I know, for better or for worse, <clears throat> excuse me, it came into being with the intended, with the intention to avoid offenses and terms that use attributes of members of particular groups in society in disparaging ways. At its best, it is to avoid language that excludes, marginalizes, or is insulting to people that are already historically disadvantaged and discriminated against by perhaps ethnicity, sex, gender, size, 
education, physical attributes, and abilities. So I want to lift up that one of the benefits of political correctedness is that it has brought awareness of how name calling often uses a handicap as an, as an insult. Criticizing or putting someone down by calling them lame or retarded, something that was done ad nauseum when I was in the middle school in the 1970s, is disparaging to people whose bodies have physical limits or who have had developmental challenges. It is offensive, it is unkind, and in many ways it is just plain cruel. We cannot deny that able bodies have been idealized as a standard for all bodies to model themselves after, oftentimes painstakingly, regardless of the actual physical truth, setting all of those millions of people at a disadvantage. But we can adjust this standard one slogan at a time. And one such slogan came into being with the best of intentions, and it was made into a beloved song and became the name of a UU public advocacy campaign. It is standing on the side of love. We have a banner with those written words written on it for participation in parades. And it came to being in 2009 when Proposition 8 was on the California ballot. And then UUA President Reverend Bill Singford was asked by the media, where does Unitarian Universalism stand in regards to gay marriage? And his reply was, we stand on the side of love. For all intents and purposes, this is a fair statement. Yet it was pointed out by people in wheelchairs that standing is not something everybody can do. So it was agreed upon to modify the phrase, removing one word and making a world of difference. The campaign is now called Side with Love, and it still means the same thing. And it was in that same year that our UUF member Jennifer Choate and others worked together to qualify so the fellowship could qualify what is called the welcoming congregation. And welcoming became a code word for the LGBTQ plus communities. And you can learn more about this on the UUA website. And here is a bit of our fellowship history in this regard. Around the time that I joined in 1996, there had been a brouhaha regarding the behavior of a member. And I will hold back on stating the name of this family because I have no intention of shaming. So I will call her J and him T. And the way I understand it is T was very unspoke, uh, outspoken about his opposition to homosexuality, a point of view that many people found offensive and not in keeping with our Unitarian Universalist values, principles, vision, and mission. As it turned out, a gay couple were so uncomfortable with him that they left the fellowship. This situation was brought before the board and an opportunity for conflict resolution was presented, but he refused. And so it was decided that he would be asked to leave the membership of the congregation. It was not an easy decision to make and very deliberate considerations were taken into account. Jay, on the other hand, did not want to leave. She was a member of the choir and the social action committee. And so she stayed on as a member until they moved out of the state. Here's another fellowship example. 
Reverend Carol Rudisil was a part of the clergy in attendance for my ordination. I had asked them all to read a verse from the writing of Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker, who is the former president of Star King School for the Ministry and an esteemed minister in our denomination. Carol's part of the reading was called On Groundedness, and the original version read, quote, the human being who ministers is grounded and does not leave the path ahead but stands to that which is good, end quote. With a simple change of a word, the statement became one that Carol, who uses a wheelchair, could speak from her own experience. And knowing Dr. Parker, I feel quite certain that she would approve of the alteration. So Carol read, the human being who ministers is grounded and does not leave the path ahead, but holds fast to that which is good. The request to modify our language in order to increase the capacity, the accuracy, and the inclusion of our community citizens takes a conscious effort, including mindful consideration, patience with the process, and a willingness to give up cliches and colloquial terms that perhaps we grew up with. I catch myself doing that a lot. It is an opportunity to arrest them when they come to mind, and then be creative. Try something new that is life-affirming. This shift is vigilant. I asked my husband, Scott, what does inclusivity mean to you? And he said, every person is unique and every person has something that they are really good at that they can share with others. So the more you include, the more good things can be shared, such as a skill or a point of view. Then I asked, what are the disadvantages of inclusivity? And he said, fear of the unknown, including things you don't understand or know can be fearful for some people. I feel that we live in a paradox of inclusivity and exclusivity of what we are compatible with and what we are not. And as Unitarian Universalists, by the very nature of our religion, we strive to bring equity to all relationships as best as we can. And our first principle, as we've mentioned several times in the service already, but affirming and promoting the inherent worth and dignity of every person is a huge request. One that we can spend a lifetime working on and likely we will. Every bit of effort toward it is valuable and, a, and an ideal use of our time, talent, and treasure. It is one of the ways that we can make a difference in the world. And so I ask you to contemplate this. How are you already being inclusive? And give yourself credit for that. What more can you do and find a way to do it? How can we gently and forthrightly tell a person who is using a disparaging term that it is harmful? That takes a lot of courage. No doubt, it is one of the most challenging parts of the shift, yet, when inclusiveness and the necessity of it is brought forward, it can happen in beautiful ways. And when exclusiveness is necessary, what needs to happen so that it does not cause harm? Being inclusive requires making room for differences and drawing the circle wide.
Blessed be this good work.